Hi everybody, Matt Young, but Hoss, head of open source strategy here at Percona, welcoming you to another Percona Tech Talk, where we're going to bring you the best in the open source space and give you the most interesting, fun speakers ever. We hope you enjoy the show. So, David, uh, how have you been? Where have you? What have you been up to? Um, I know, like you know, you've you've been busy since the last time I saw you, which was actually in person in Percona Live Amsterdam, like a year and a few months ago. Yeah, yeah. So um, um, obviously, you know, when I, when, I, when I was at Percona, I moved to Europe. So my last year has been kind of interesting because uh, COVID didn't let me travel, but I'm working towards my citizenship in Ireland anyway. So haven't gone into Perconas this year. Uh, like even if you had them, I wasn't going to be able to do it. It's also why I didn't talk this time because I was just like, uh, I yeah. didn't know how that, all that was going to play out. But broadly speaking, um, after I left Percona, I went to Huawei um, and I was working with them on their cloud. And so it's Postgres, MySQL, helping them kind of start looking at SRE fundamentals in general, okay. DBRE fundamentals. Um, obviously, through the course of American politics and the China versus US thing, I decided it was probably better if I didn't work for that specific Chinese company while I didn't have a European citizenship. <laughs> makes sense. It totally makes sense. Um, and so uh, I ended up kind of forming my own, uh, oh, well, I'm under an umbrella type company that I did. And I work with um, Aer Lingus a lot as one of my main type customers. Oh, wow. Yeah, great. And so what I do with them is I kind of came in, as, as you would expect, you know me a while. They brought me in because they had a lot of problems with Mongo. They were looking at modernizing and automating and all of these types of things. And so that was great. And then they kind of came in, I kind of did that. I did a whole cybersecurity review with them. And I was like, okay, this is how we fix Mongo and how we secure Mongo for you. Um, it was great. Um, but then they turned around and they're like, okay, well, how can you make our builds of Oracle faster? Cause it takes us three weeks to build an environment. And so uh, because of that, I kind of brought, started bringing them on an SRE mindset to shift out of their mm -hmm. database administrator mindset into sharing more with the dev teams as far as knowledge and accessibility, but also maintaining the right framework so that the database experts are still leading the charge on how to do it. They're just enabling those other people to do the thing. Well, and we started talking just recently, exchanging some threads when I posted my question of the week, which was, do you still need a DBA anymore? Um, and, I, and I said, you really need more of an SRE. You said a DBRE. And so, hey, let's talk about that. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, I, I'm, I'm curious from your perspective, you know, where do you see that line between DBA and DBRE and then DBRE and SRE, right? So database reliability engineer versus site reliability engineer versus DBA, database administrator. Yeah, so a lot of it comes down to where the company is in their DevOps lifecycle model. So um, some companies that they're still going to have a central database bank, they get the choice here. Do, are we going to going to have it to where the DBA just manage the application sitting on the physical server or the hypervisor, whatever you're using, and they're just managing that, but only that app, they don't have root access, et cetera, et cetera. Very classic IT kind of scenario. Um, and so that's where the DBEs kind of fall in the spectrum of the thread that we talk. Um, what gets more interesting is the DevOps uh, versus SRE versus DBRE. And that all comes down to where you want ownership because in some companies they're like, oh, which is more like Google model. They're like, okay, well, I want every developer to also be a DBA, to also be a network admin. And they just are yeah, the jack of all trades. Their specific product stack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there's other places that they're like, no, we don't want to do that. What we want to do is create a specialty group inside of our DevOps SRE model that are the database experts. And what happens is kind of base things are done in general purpose, like having immutable servers and stuff like that are done in my main SRE group. But my DBRE group is all about how do I take a lot of those principles and apply them to a stateful system that I can't just blow away and recreate. I need to think about it differently. I need to think how am I gonna do patching of, a, of this system rather than destroy it and create blue versus green kind of scenarios. Um, and I think that's where the big split between DBRE and SRE comes from, is that specialty knowledge. One of the things I did after I left working for Percona is I was also working with um, 
service now. And in their model, they have um, an SRE team, typical DevOps, the SRE team. But in that, they have something they called SWAT. And SWAT was specifically database expert type people, Java memory debugging type things. So very much your escalation firefighter group that could come in and explain these deep, weird problems that your person that really about Terraform and using endpoints and Amazon. So it was a real expert. It was like yeah. you, you had a you had a vertical expert for yeah. different topics. And so so in, in traditional like in your in your four tier model support approach that everybody I think is familiar with, you would say that your DevOps group or your SRE group in that case was your ones and twos, but your threes and fours more in this specialty group. Okay. And and I've kind of done the same thing working with Air Lingus in that I uh, I'm trying to get the more DevOps group to work with us and they're doing a lot of the Terraform stuff and we're providing guidance and recommendations to them. But my team's building the AMI, for example, and we're okay. building those flows and I'm setting requirements like, it's great you're using AWS session manager and you're logging in with the SSM user on your app tiers with immutable servers. But for my databases, I want you to drop them in as their LDAP or AD user and then they have to pass through the privileges to be able to get to the database data access. They so are you still getting them. the escalations on, you know, the performance issues and the troubleshooting? Are you still, I mean, as, as your environment grows, you know, and you're doing the needle in the haystack searching, is that kind of like still that role in the DBRE? Yeah, absolutely. The way we have it structured is there's like a digital production support, which is run mostly from our DevOps stuff. And it's a mix of legacy kit and new AWS DevOps kind of design. And what we're doing there is if there's a call out to the DBA team, they're calling out to us to support the performance or support we're, we're having this issue or the database slowed down or uh, we're getting this alert that the database ran out of this space. Um, or a table space was full, different things like that that you would typically have. But what we're being tasked with, because again, I'm only a year into the, this transition, what I'm doing more and more is, is automating more and more of that, getting ready to ship all my database audit logs into CloudWatch, for example, doing yeah. stuff like how do I start putting in agents or cron jobs that will auto grow the database, but fire off an ops gene slash Jira slash whatever support ticket system you're using message to you to actually tell the DBA, hey, last night you would have been woken up, the DBRE um, in this case, um, you would have been woken up, but I went ahead and added an extra 10 gigs of space to the system and added a new data file to Oracle so that you could sleep. Please look at this before it gets out of control and does it again. So yeah, so you're doing a lot more of, I mean, almost like a, 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 a very basic type functionality around the, the, the automation that's yeah. you know, looking for those events and trying to auto correct and fix. Yeah. So we're starting with that, but also I, like I, I mentioned earlier, I took the Oracle build process is now completely automated to where you, you tell Terraform, set these tags on the system. It'll build the right version of Oracle with the right SID and all this type of stuff. But then it, if it's this type of SID, it will also fire off installing the app and loading data from the staging environment into it to where you have a completely working database ready for an app to connect to it. In so is this app. about making the developers more efficient and making them move faster? So it's, it's a couple of things. It's, it's making them more efficient, but also making it easier for them to request an environment to test something or do something that, to where you get more into a, a dev environment should be just build it and throw it away when you're done with project X or test X instead of the classic IT approach where I had, you know, dev environment one through 10 and you're currently assigned to one, you're currently assigned to 10. And then when you roll off that, assign somebody else onto it, which as you know, and everybody watching this probably knows can be an utter nightmare to manage. And from a compatibility or finding weird snowflakey edge cases of things that weren't cleaned up <laughs> becomes unmanageable. Well, and I mean, you, you guys are using a lot of microservices. And so that's just going to make it so, you know, people can spin those up much quicker, but it's, does, does it leave the potential to just have like a massive number of databases that are out there? And a lot of them are just kind of like forgotten about. Um, to some degree, um, what we do a lot with what we're doing is you have these environments that you can build those, but there's, there's tags in it as well to, to where it protects the environment that you're at. And does it create HA? Does it not create HA? 
Um, and then also there's reporting on how, how much usage was the system getting? Do we think that this dev environment is no longer used? Should we stop using? So it's all about being able to reclaim that. Now, remember that as, a, as being in an airline and in this transitionary step, we still have a lot of waterfall -y type processes in some place for spinning stuff up. But all of what we're building now is enabling people to move to a place that when they want to do product-centric development, they want to do more microservices, they can do so. And as more of that happens, I'll be looking at, well, do I create um, kind of, in Oracle terms, a, a central CDB that has different PDBs in it? Or do I flip that around and have a cloud or a DDoS of some sort in place? Um, now, I have a different viewpoint than I think uh, Percona has on this because I don't believe that you should have stuff in Kubernetes if it's your database. That's the application layer. Um, there's a big fight, I think, right now inside the database community on those, those lines and where, where those should fit. I was talking to Charity about that recently. <laughs> yeah, and I think, I think everybody has a little bit of a different mindset around like the Kubernetes side. You know, so many applications have adopted, you know, containerization and Kubernetes for the microservices. There's a lot of companies that want to use their, you know, databases the same way they use the application layer. Doesn't always work. Sometimes it does. I mean, my, my philosophy, and I had actually posted a video on this as well, uh, is it depends, right? Yeah. There's no way I'm going to run a multi-terabyte database in Kubernetes. I'm sorry. It's just, it's just not, that's not there. But Hey, if I've got a hundred WordPress, you know, databases and like, they're all these little small databases, you know, yeah, sure. Or even some of the medium size, but I have seen a lot of people really successful in, you know, um, reasonable size. I'm not going to say massive, but reasonable size Kubernetes, you know, deployments. And, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, it's not that, it's not that I'm against using it. It's that you're kind of shoehorning in the database there. And if your database, like you said, is small enough. It makes a lot of sense and it fits. Kubernetes does make things fit much better in your microservices and SRE strategies in general. It just does. Um, but the flip side is you, you're still you're still running some risks with databases because Kubernetes would never envisioned truly stateful systems. Like that's wasn't what it was designed to solve. And, yeah, so, and there's a lot of work on that that's been yeah. going on. I mean, um, I know we've talked to a lot of the folks in the uh, data on Kubernetes community. Uh, for instance, Doc, I don't know if you're familiar with them. Um, uh, you know, the, the folks at Datastacks, I know, are, are looking at Kubernetes. I know the MariaDB folks are looking at Kubernetes. That, that's what Sky SQL is built on. Um, Planet Scale guys, right? Like, so I think there's a lot of emphasis. I don't know how long it will take to get, you know, fully there, but I do see a lot of production workload there so far. Um, it's not everything now, it, and it's far from everything. But I yeah. think that's, that's like any technology, right? And yeah, the, I, you know, yeah. And, and that's what I was, that's what I've been debating more recently is how far along is that gonna go? And is it going to be kind of, kind of the, the approach Docker had, had in general taken for a while, which was it's fine in dev, but when you go to critical platinum prod systems, you draw a line and says, say this need to be actual instances as opposed to containers. Um, but it, it, it could be that, you know, in four years, we're talking about how were we ever not on containers? Uh, and, and yeah, and I, I, and I think that's the, the thing, right? It's like, there's a lot of work there. It'll still evolve. Is it ready for everything? No. But it can handle a lot of, you know, a lot of the smaller things and a lot of the medium-sized things. I just wouldn't I, put I think Mongo, we'll see it in Mongo much more verbosely than we see it in MySQL or Postgres, I think. Because well, Mongo, Mongo's HA is, is built on things that would make it continue to work in a Kubernetes environment. Yeah. And I mean, it, it different levels, different databases, different ease of use. So yeah, I mean, it, it's an interesting topic, an interesting debate for sure. Um, because it is something that as you get the larger systems and the, the more volume, it's, it's harder to manage. And yeah. Kubernetes just makes it so much easier, right? I mean, that's, well, the, that's the thing. And I, I would say that's where a lot of my automation comes in is I have a, a relatively small team um, of people. And 
we're, we're managing lots of systems and more systems are being piled into this team, being brought into AWS as we're doing more, more of our digital transformation into the clouds in general with the airlines. But what, what I, I'm noticing is a lot of people are very surprised by once you start down this kind of standards approach and automated builds with Terraform and stuff, just how much your team actually gets to focus on making sure your design is right as opposed to just building infrastructure. No, so it really does flip that where it's more, hey, let's design the architecture correct and let's let the infrastructure kind of handle itself. Yeah, yeah. Um, because yeah, I, I'm at the point that when we build a new environment for the website side of the airline, I can get hand it to the normal infrastructure team that builds all of the infrastructure and that builds a database that triggers all the stuff with the database. And then I just get one of my DBRD team to do a quick QC of it. So I spend an hour on uh, where before we had three weeks assigned to somebody doing that. Through those two and a half other weeks, I get to spend on improving that or looking at the next version or testing patches or all the things that we should have been doing, but teams never had time for because they were too busy in the firefighting. So a lot of, you know, as you do your modernization, it sounds like you guys are kind of standardizing on AWS. Uh, well, I, I think that's the first day, uh, first uh, cloud of choice. Um, but the, there is definitely a very strong hybrid cloud view. Okay. Well, so you're looking at the multi-cloud to, yeah. and, and any reason why? Uh, well, it, it's just in case we needed to pivot for different things. We, we are in, in Ireland. And so AWS has a big presence here. So that, that makes a lot of sense. But also like as, as different times evolve, we need to look at that. We need to make sure that, you know, AWS can't come down and say, hey, you now don't get any discounts. This is your new rate, tough, live with it. At the same so time- it's, it's more of a price protection thing for you. There, there's a price protection aspect of it, but there's also the other side of it, which <laughs> is how do we make sure that if AWS has a critical failure, we have a plan on how to get off of that. Um, we, we, could, we could talk about like, recently there was a platform that got deplatformed from AWS and they were like, oh, we're already, we, we can just shift. And then they sued because they found out they couldn't shift. Um, oh, so they tried to do just a, like a lift and shift and didn't work. Well yeah, well, yeah, and they had always said they could do it until AWS pulled their plug for different things that happened in America recently. And then they couldn't do it. And so they resorted to the legal system because it basically shut down their company. We don't want to be in that position that for, for whatever reason, whether it's AWS resourcing, pricing, or a, a some sort of environmental thing that just takes a, a data center offline, that we couldn't just shift somewhere else. We want to make sure that we have that flexibility. But from my perspective, it's also, it's making sure that you're trying to use generic tools. For example, we could be using um, a different AWS um, contain, uh, image builder and, and stuff like that, but we're still using things like Git, Bitbucket, Terraform, stuff like that, so that we're staying that agnostic level. And that okay, we so you're, you're trying to stay the arm's length, so you have the portability. Yeah. So you but could at the same time, if, if when you're trying to adopt it, especially when you're early in your DT uh, level, especially with DBRE and stuff, there are going to be times where you're like, I should use Aurora or I should use RDS for these different things. And you have to take a measured approach and not be always arm's distance, but always not tied too closely to a cloud to go, okay, I don't want to invest in trying to rebuild what they've already built for now. So let's just use that thing with a backlog item of how could we do this in a more non, non vendor specific way? Because like RDS and Aurora, they solve some good problems but they do have some other ones. Like you have way more control over failovers if you have EC2 instances. Like <laughs> if, if, you're, if you're using a, a database as a service from a cloud provider, you're kind of just stuck going, well, oh, the failover is happening. There's nothing I can do as a DBRE, which is a very unsettling thing for me personally, because I don't like the fact that I can't tell people when I expect the database to be back up because I'm waiting on AWS's Azure's Google scheduler 
So it's a, it's a trust it. thing as well, right? Like yeah. so, so you've got like this, um, you know, trust aspect. Um, yeah, I think there's also there's a trust aspect, but there's also a control aspect to a large degree because you lose a lot of control when you hand these things off. Um, and similarly, I have conversations all the time about should we move something to a database as a service provider, whether it's Mongo Atlas, whether it's RDS, Aurora, different things like that, or snowflakes of the world, stuff like that. Or should we maintain control because how often are we gonna be able to update that given app? Are we gonna run into a problem when that vendor says, hey, we're decommissioning version X upgrade your app and we're like, whoa, we don't have that team anymore or the third party we paid to build that app no longer exists. How do we update this to a new driver? Like, Well, and I mean, it, most of these databases of services though, they have features that are only exclusive for that and the, that really wrecks that portability, doesn't it? It, it does, um, but, but also just broadly speaking, for example, like if, if I wanted to adopt Postgres quickly, I might use RDS Postgres, but then put a time gate on it to say, okay, by this time, we need to have a non-AWS native approach to the same thing. So it's rapid prototyping. Yeah. Um, where, where you because that I think minute. that's important in your DevOps model is you don't block, block rapid prototyping, but you keep a, your mind on how do I keep a keep myself in a position that I can pivot these things to a new technology and versus how tightly do I tie into this one cloud provider, which has benefits, don't get me wrong, there are very strong benefits to having tight coupling. Um, it's just a matter of where you wanna spend the money. Do I wanna spend the money on features and prototyping or do I wanna spend the money on resiliency and scalability? Because those are different buckets that unfortunately too many people try to merge into one. So let me ask you this. Do you need a DBRE or a DBA in that cloud model if you're running databases as a service? Yes. Think about it this way. Um, I'm running I'm running RDS Oracle, for example. Um, it doesn't matter that I'm running RDS Oracle. I still need a DBA to help plan out partitions and table spaces and data file allocations and stuff like that. Because while it manages the operating system for you and it can scale storage and stuff like that, if you just set a database to auto extend, you will have fragmentation problems. If you have not planned your data structure out, you will have shared segment problems and neighbor segment problems and all these other things that still exist. You will have wasted memory, you will have missing indexes or just bad design because somebody put a, a blog where they should put a bar car 200 in. Like, <laughs> um, and you can't expect your, your DevOps devs to know how to fine tune it to that level. What you expect them to do is come up with a plan and then you need an expert to kind of cross check that. What we do in our stuff is we have both internal and external developers in, in the airline. And the DBRE team is part of the ending of their dev phase of stuff when they try to go into sit and test and prod and all of that when they kind of are ready to say, oh, I think we're dev feature complete. We want to merge this into the upstream. The DBRE team looks over the schema and advises them over different pitfalls they'll have. It doesn't matter that they're on RDS or some other da database as a service platform. That review still needs to happen so that what worked in dev doesn't fall apart at scale. Yeah, and, so, I, so yeah, you do. I yeah, mean, it, and yeah. it sounds like the, the DBA isn't necessarily doing the classic DBA of install and you know the you know orchestration, they don't need to. It's more yeah. on that development cycle. So they need to have that good relationship, that good integration with the developers, the architects, and the DevOps folks. Yeah, and ideally in your DBRE team, what you'll want to have is kind of a principal DBRE for Oracle, Mongo, MySQL, whatever your techs are that you're using. And then another one that is your principal tooling DBRE. And that way you get the benefits of those people working closely together, but not as spread out as a full, every SRE is also a DBA mindset that some people have. Um, but what you do is that team, it's relatively small, can then teach and provide tooling to the rest of the SRE organization to enable them 
so that this team is only doing that last mile slash architecture design and everybody else is utilizing the pattern that's been provided to them. Cool. Well, let me leave you with this question. And I like to ask this question because I'm just curious. Mm -hmm. One of those guys. So is there anything that you continue to see plagues your developers, the DBA staff or, or your internal folks or the folks that you work with? Um, you know, is there a consistent issue that if they would just stop doing that, your life would be like 10 times easier? So um, there's a couple things. Um, and I actually have projects on our DT backlog for one of these. Okay. The first one is config management. Okay. The number of people that try to copy dev A to UAT's config files and then screw up the database because they're using the wrong sequence values or, or different things that blow everything up or just simple things like they're copying from A to B and they are like in Oracle, there's a difference between a SID and a service. Um, SID is kind of the, the instance identifier where a service is, is you wanting to expose a different friendlier view of it. Well, the difference in the JDBC driver on that is whether you use a colon or a slash. And so one of my projects that I've been pushing for is for us to store stuff in secrets, whether that's a Terraform, uh, a, um, I forgot their company name. Um, who makes Terraform and Vault? Oh, uh, HashiCorp. Hashi yeah, HashiCorp, there you go. Um, whether it's HashiCorp Vault or AWS Secrets or Azure or Google, everybody has a secret store. Right. It's, getting, it's getting the developers, especially the DevOps teams, to start thinking about using those toolings to provide their parameters to then get those configs to where they're just auto-built. And all the DBRE team needs to provide to the other teams is this is your config template. Use that. We'll automatically populate your passwords in this location, and it'll fetch them. And whether it's solid or Ansible, it'll fetch them. It'll pull them. Your life will be better. You won't have these problems. Um, but then there's other things where the number of times I see developers think they can just write a SQL statement and they're like, oh, well, select star from blah, 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 join on blah, 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 join on blah, 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 join on blah, 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 is fine. And then I'm like, are you sure you're going to have the indexes that you're using there? Because if not, your database is going to tank. Also, select star is very dangerous. If you add a column, you just potentially broke broke your application. Indeed. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, and it's uh, and it's they're all small things. It's just yeah. those small things matter so much. But but these things keep happening, and this has what been one of my arguments with uh, with the different leadership team on why a DBRE team was needed, because you needed that knowledge, you needed that ability for somebody to quickly look at something and go, yeah, you really shouldn't do that because you're going to hurt yourself in six months when you forget why you did it. And you wouldn't expect a, any general developer to do it. And you see a repeat problem of them doing it over and over. Right. It's just the continual thing that. Yeah. You know, Cause you're, you're just, you're playing whack-a-mole with different developer groups or different developers. And then let's face it. Sometimes you run into technical people that like to do it their way and just don't really listen. No, technical people are totally willing to listen to everything that, you know, you, your DBAs, DBREs say, right? Like, they're, um, they're totally willing. Well, and, and, and I said technical people because I include DBREs and DBAs in that, that oh. they're some of the, the worst offenders of a DBA trying to transition to DBRE has a really hard time taking the hands off of the black box and letting people peer into that world. Mm. They're... they're and, and that's one of the things that I focused, um, gosh, since I was with, um, with Object Rocket, I've been focusing, as you saw, trying to get people to shift more into the trust others they mean well kind of mindset. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Try, you know, like you can have good intentions, right? They assume good intentions. Yeah. People aren't trying to, to, to be mean. They're not trying to make your life hard, you know? Um, yeah. And, and just to help people understand that the DBRE, DBAs can shift to DBRE, it's a change in roles, but just because you're giving people access to do these things doesn't mean that the business doesn't need you to do these 15 other things that you've just never had the time for. Right. And they're excited that they get to give you these things that are actually more interesting to you. 
but you just didn't know it because you were so used to your existing mindset that you were afraid of that change. Right. Well, David, thanks for you know chatting with me for a few minutes today. I really appreciate it. I think this was very good to talk about the, the DBRE journey and a few of the things that you guys got going on over there. Um, sounds like you got a lot of work and it's exciting. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I'm sure I'll see you at one of the conferences soon. Hopefully, hopefully we'll all get our vaccinations and we'll be <laughs> at conferences in person. Yeah, I, I, I am hoping for that. Um, I very much am. I'm missing FOSDEM. I'm... <laughs> I really don't like that. I, uh, I'll have missed two years of it now. It's the virtual. It's the virtual FOSS time. Yeah, but it's not the same. I'll, 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 I'll have beer. At, it's going to be like five o'clock in the morning for my session. I'll, I'll drink a beer while the session's going on. Just, just, just to make it a little more normal. Yeah, that's true. But anyway, it was good to have it chatting with you. All right. Great chatting with you as well. Right. What a great tech talk. We hope you appreciate it. If you did, go ahead and like it. If you haven't, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, Facebook, Twitter, and of course, on Instagram. We really appreciate you being here with us, and we hope that you have a great day, and tune in next time.